Amen. Well, let's talk about Jesus this morning. That's why we're here. So let's talk about Jesus today. Today is the third installment of our series, Larger Than Life. And in this series, we are exploring the life of Noah. Um, it's a his story is pretty straightforward, and his account is very straightforward. It's not very long. It's four chapters, Genesis 6, 7, 8, and 9. If you buckle down and read it, you could probably read it in about 12 minutes. Um, but we're diving deep. We want to spend more than 12 minutes with Noah, and we want to spend more than just four chapters with Noah. We want to dive deep. And though Noah seems larger than life because of how God used him in the, that, that incredible way, I'm praying and believing that as we are going through this series, we're seeing that maybe he has some of the same struggles that we have, or maybe that we have many relatable similarities with him. Thus far, we've looked at his name, and we looked at the expectation placed on him from birth. And then a couple weeks ago, we looked at his task and the job of building the ark and how it was a demand far beyond his ability. This morning, we're going to continue with the account. And I want to start off by reading just a couple of a few verses from Genesis chapter 7. I'm going to start in verse 11. It says, in the 600th year of Noah's life, that, that's seasoned right there, in the 600th year of Noah's life, on the 17th day of the second month, on that day, all the springs of the deep burst forth and the floodgates of heaven were open and rain fell on the earth 40 days and 40 nights. If you're reading along in your app or a Bible, we're going to skip ahead to 17. It says, For 40 days the flood kept coming on the earth, and as the waters increased, they lifted the ark high above the earth. The waters rose and increased greatly on the earth, and the ark floated on the surface of the water. They rose greatly on the earth, and all the high mountains under the entire heavens were covered. The waters rose and covered the mountains to a depth of more than 15 cubits. And every living thing that moved on the land perished. Birds, livestock, wild animals, all the creatures that swarm over the earth, and all mankind. Everything on dry land that had the breath of life in its nostrils died. And every living thing on the face of the earth was wiped out. People and animals and the creatures that move along the ground and the birds were wiped from the earth. And only Noah was left and those with him in the ark. This morning, we're going to look at the workmanship of what Noah built. And if I were to title my message today, it would be this, floating isn't enough. Floating isn't enough. Let's pray for the word. Lord, we thank you for your word today. We thank you for the bread of life that it is. We pray that it would be nurturing, fulfilling, and life-changing for us. We claim it in Jesus' name. Amen. Just about my entire adult life has been spent in Central Florida. I moved here at 19 years old and have never lived anywhere else since. Because that was 23 years ago now, I must admit my viewpoint on this might be a little bit skewed and I might even be flat out wrong, but yet it seems to me there is nothing like Florida rain. Nothing like Florida rain, no matter where you go. Florida rain is different than anywhere else. Most of my childhood, I shared maybe like a month, month and a half ago, how we spent a little bit of time in New Mexico. After that, we, we moved into the Midwest, Illinois, and then I spent the my remainder of my teenage years in Ohio. I don't recall those times in the Midwest a single time where the rain came down so hard that you have to come to a complete or near stop on a major highway just so that you don't hit the person in front of you and pray to God that nobody hits you from behind. Why? Because you can't see more than two or three feet in front of you. Growing up, I, I don't recall downpour so heavy that they flood the yard and, and, and the street in front of the house, yet every house that we've lived in in Florida, there are several summer rains that seem to flood the yard and then the, the street. There's nothing quite like a Florida rain, unless you think about the rain in Genesis 7. You know, many Christians hold the viewpoint that there wasn't a single drop of rain prior to the flood. 
I'm not going to debate or argue a point, but let me present to you another viewpoint this morning. The no rain view comes from Genesis chapter 2, verses 5 and 6. It says, no shrub had yet appeared, no plant had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not sent rain upon the earth yet. Uh, but streams came up from the earth and watered the whole surface of the ground. And that's where the no rain view comes. But you also have to look at how God creates everything with purpose. And God creates the heavens and the earth with purpose. And so the functions of the heavens and the earth are created with them. And another viewpoint says that water evaporation and cloud formation and, yes, even precipitation that continually recycles our water supply, it was not in some sort of limbo for 1,600 years. But yet Hebrews chapter 11 verse 7 says, By faith Noah, when warned about things not yet seen, in holy fear built an ark to save his family. So where both viewpoints can meet is this right here. Whether it's the first drop of rain or not, nothing like what was sent in Genesis 7 had been seen before. In a single moment, the earth and the heavens open and simultaneously water erupts from below and is released from above. I'd love to spend a few minutes over-dramatizing the setting and talk about the wind and the waves and the thunder and the lightning and, and the, the water tornadoes and the vortexes. I'd love to do that. And maybe all those things were present. I don't know. The Bible doesn't say anything about it, so I'm not going to. But what I do know is this, is that for 40 days, an unspeakable amount of water flowed from the earth and the skies until the tops of the mountains were 23 feet underwater. Wind or not, that amount of water that bombarded the ark for 40 days makes the quality of Noah's work not just commendable, it's monumental. I mean, it's one thing to build something to survive sitting on the ground. It's completely different to build something to survive six weeks of torrential downpour and then months on the open waters. But that's what Noah did. He built something that endured. And the ark not only endured the storm, it spent the next five months drifting until the water had receded enough for the ark to finally come to rest on the top of Mount Ararat. Forty days of terror as the rain beats down on the ark and then five months of just floating. Every creek, every crack, every little bend that the ark makes sends Noah and his family into a panic. Will the peg holds? Will the pitch keep the water out? Wondering, is this boat going to stay afloat? About a year ago, I preached a message called Built to Last. And it was about how when you are in Christ, you are built to last. You're, you're not meant to be overcome. You're, you're meant to stand firm and you're meant to stand long. And the message gave three ways to make sure that you are built to last. You, you, you check for cracks. You, you build for breakthrough. And you don't undercut the upkeep. Today, I want to look at what it is you are building. You are built to last, but you are building something as well that is built to last. We're all building something. It may not be an ark that's the third of a size of a cruise ship, but it's just as significant and it's just as important. We're building it with our family. We're, we're, we're building it in our businesses and in our careers. We're, we're building it in the, in the ministries in which we serve. We're building it in with, with our reputation in the community. And what it is we're building is it's his kingdom. We're building his kingdom. We are called to build his kingdom. And whatever we build, and especially his kingdom, we want to make sure that it's more than waterproof, that it's more than seaworthy, because floating isn't enough. When it comes to what it is we build for Jesus, floating isn't enough. We want it to be storm-worthy. There's a lot of things that float. And they can handle the rain and the water, 
But when the storms come, it'll be torn apart. Look at me, we'll look at with what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7. He's closing out the Sermon on the Mount, and he says, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice, it's like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rains came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. It was made to survive. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rains came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. For decades, Noah built his ark, knowing that the rains were coming and that the ark he was building would be put to the test. And we, as disciples of Jesus, we cannot lose sight and we cannot forget that storms are coming. Surges are coming. Swells and squalls, they are coming. And all that we build for the kingdom must stand up to it all. And so this morning, I want to talk about three ways to ensure that what we build for his kingdom, it endures for his kingdom. The first one is this, is what we build will last when we invest his provision in the kingdom. We invest his provision in the kingdom. Have you ever thought about the investment that the ark, uh, what Noah had to put out as an investment to construct that? When you're three or, and, or so and hear the story for the first time, definitely not. You're not thinking about those things. In fact, I could probably guarantee if the thought has ever even crossed your mind, it never even started until you started to pay things for yourself or manage time for yourself. Maybe you were building a house one year and you were reading Genesis chapter 6 at the same time and the thought fired across your synapses. Man, that ark cost Noah a lot. The ark was a kingdom endeavor. It was. It was a kingdom endeavor. And kingdom endeavors require everything. That's what Jesus said. Jesus said, to build my kingdom, it costs everything. In Luke chapter 14, he says in verse 26, if anyone comes to me and does not hate father or mother, wife and children, brother and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person, they cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not carry their cross and follow me, they cannot be my disciple. He says in verse 23, those of you who do not give up everything you have, you cannot be my disciple. And in case you've never looked at it this way, for just a moment, let's think about and let's look at the investment of the ark. It was of the, what it was for Noah. To build the ark, Noah invested every resource he had, every piece of provision he had, every ounce of strength is put into the ark. Every second of the day is put into the ark. Every piece of knowledge he has is put into the ark. Every relationship he had is put into the ark. Every resource he called his own, every and anything and everything he could get his hands on, it's put into the ark. It was all for this one thing. Kingdom building isn't to be taken lightly. You can't rely on motivation to build the kingdom. Motivations come and go. <laughs> you know motivations come and go. This might shock you, but there's, few, there's, there's times when I don't feel like pastoring. There's, there's days I don't feel like being called dad. There, there's days I, I don't feel like being called husband. There's days I don't feel like being a responsible adult. But to survive the storm, kingdom building, it must be an obsession. Motivation isn't enough. It must be an obsession. Obsession moves beyond motivation because it doesn't matter how you feel about it. The obsessed give it all. Jesus said we must be aware of the investment before we start because without it, if we don't, our boat's not going to stay afloat. Look at Luke 14. He says, kind of sandwiched between what I just read in verses 28 and 29, suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Won't you first sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to complete it? 
For if you lay the foundation and are not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule you. Kingdom priorities always require kingdom investments. Always require kingdom investments. And it's helpful to remember whatever it is that I invest for God, it may be my time, it may be some money, it may be my talent and ability. It's not mine to begin with. It's not mine to begin with. All I have is his, and he's given it to me to steward and to use for his kingdom. Let me be bold for a few moments here. Some of you aren't investing in the things of God, and it shows in your life. It shows in your life. Your peace is gone. Your joy is gone. Expectation you once had, it's gone. I mean, you may have little to no financial problems. You may have little to no health problems. It may seem like all is okay, but it's far from okay. It's almost as if all that matters to you has been devoured. It's been devoured. And it brings so much power. That phrase right there, it's been devoured. It brings so much power to Malachi chapter 3. Because God said in Malachi chapter 3, specifically verse 10, that when we bring the tithe into the storehouse, what does he do? He opens the floodgates of heaven and he pours out so much blessing that we would not be able to contain it. I can't help but correlate that, that open the floodgates of heaven in Malachi 3.10 to the open the floodgates that Noah experienced in Genesis chapter 7. It actually says the same words. God opened the floodgates of the heavens. We love floodgates being opened. Oh, that's wonderful. But the true blessing actually is in Malachi 3.11. And if you read it in the NIV and the NLT, it might not give you the same punch. So you got to go a little old school. You got to go KJV, NKJV, NASB, or, or maybe if you want a newer version of that, the ESV. It says in Malachi 3.11, and I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes. And he will not destroy the fruits of your ground, neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field. Do you feel devoured today? Do you need the devourer gone from your life today? It's time to start investing in the things of God once again. It's time to give him everything once again. And this morning, if you, all you hear is money, 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 you have the wrong thing going on in your mind because this is not a money thing. It's a heart thing. Jesus, he wants your entire heart. He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Your purpose isn't sunk yet. It's not too late. Start today. Start incrementally. Just start investing his provision, what it is that he's imparted, and what it is he's entrusted to you, back to him, and see how what you build endures. The second thing this morning, what we build will last when we intersect our goals with his kingdom. After 500 years on earth, I bet Noah has a pretty set routine that was aligned with his priorities and his goals. I like to speculate. It's kind of fun. Maybe he's a farmer getting up before dawn every single day taking care of the animals. Maybe he doesn't just have animals on his farm. Maybe he also specializes in produce. Perhaps he has a vineyard, vast vineyards, has the best grapes around. He bottles the best wine. Maybe Noah has built a vast empire of agra and viticulture. And that's why after the flood, Noah plants a vineyard. It goes back to what he knows. But he turns 500 before the flood, and everything changes. He has this encounter with God and this righteous and blameless man who's faithfully walked with God, who has his own goals and his own dreams. And after this encounter, those goals and dreams, they don't matter anymore. The ark was built and stayed afloat because Noah intersected his goals with God's intentions. God intended to save Noah and his family, and for decades, nothing else mattered to Noah but the ark. Not his businesses, not his hobbies, 
nothing. All God's provision to Noah went into building the ark. All Noah's hopes, dreams, and priorities went into it. So the lesson is this. God's intentions will be fulfilled in my life and through my life when my goals are aligned with his. When Jesus gave a model for prayer, he showed us how we should pray. And he, he ensured his followers would continually keep kingdom goals at the forefront of their mind. He says in Matthew 6, 6, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. When it comes to kingdom goals and the stability of the kingdom, little matters Little more matters than a disciple whose goals, dreams, and priorities are aligned with Jesus. Jesus himself knew this. He's here on earth to lay the foundations on which the kingdom will be built. That's why he comes to earth. He's laying the foundation that all the rest of the kingdom is going to be built. And when Jesus comes head on with what he's waited 33 years to do, he's faced with what he wants and what the kingdom needs. And he prays two separate times in Matthew 26. Father, if it's possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. Father, if it's not possible for this cup to be taken from me, unless I drink it, may your will be done. And Jesus intersected his goals with the Father's priorities. And after he prayed this, what has been built by him has stood every storm for 2,000 years. The kingdom is still strong. Faith in Jesus is still strong. It still works. The gospel still works because the son aligned his priorities with the father's priorities. And when we build his kingdom, and we build for him and only him, and we strive for what matters to Jesus and only Jesus, nothing else will matter but the kingdom. So when I go to work tomorrow, it's not for the paycheck Oh, the paycheck's nice, Brother Chris. I, I, I mean, i got to admit, I like the paycheck. It's, it's beneficial, Marvin, the paycheck. It, it's good to get the paycheck, but I don't go to work for the paycheck. It's for the opportunity to make disciples. When it's inevitable that i got to go to Walmart sometime this week, it's going to happen. I think I've spaced it out so that I, I don't have to go till Tuesday. I might be able to push it off till Wednesday. I don't know. But when I inevitably have to go to Walmart this week, it's not because I need something from the store. It's so that I can keep a divine appointment that's been made. It's not that my hopes and dreams die. They just take on a new look as they become synonymous with his. He changes my heart. He changes my heart. And because I'm not wrestling with God, fighting for what my flesh wants over what his spirit desires, the product of the work that's done in his name, it's strong. It's strong. Keep the prayer of Jesus, not my will, yours be done at the forefront of your life and what you build will last. The third thing this morning, what we build will last when we intercede according to his kingdom. I bet Noah never prayed harder than when those waters let loose from the heavens above and the earth below. Decades of work have all come to this as the waters rose and lifts the ark off the ground for the first and only time all Noah can do is pray. Maybe he has a bucket of pitch ready to go just in case. A couple of leaks start springing up, water seeping through the cracks. He, he can coat it upwards real quick, which is great. But what's going to keep this boat afloat for the next five months? It's prayer. It's prayer. What's going to keep eight people from killing each other as they live in an enclosed space with a thousand different animals for over a year? It's prayer. I can't imagine many scenarios of Noah's life between his 500th birthday and his 601st birthday that didn't require intense intercession. What we build will be strengthened the most by how we pray. When we pray with his kingdom in mind, his kingdom cannot fail. The key to kingdom success is kingdom-minded intercession. 
That's what Thursday morning prayer is. Every Thursday morning we meet here 9 to 10 a.m. Someone asked me this past week if we're still doing prayer every Thursday. I said, yes, absolutely we are. Every Thursday, 9 to 10. And then they, this is how they responded. It was so encouraging to me. They said, good, because I can't make it Thursdays. I, I, I got to work, but I pray while I'm at work. I pray while I'm at work. That's how his kingdom withstands the storm. That's how what we build here at Crossroads withstands the storm, through the intercession and through the intercession for those whom his kingdom is reaching. Jesus set the example for praying for God's will above his own, but he also sets the example for interceding according to the kingdom. As he winds down his last meal with his disciples, he prays for them, and then he prays for you and I. And he says this in John 17, my prayer is not for them alone. He's speaking of his disciples. And he says, I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. That's you and I, guys. That all of them, all of us may be one, that we would act in unity. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us. May we be connected to the vine so that the world may believe that you sent me because it's all about the kingdom and it's all about those that still need to experience the kingdom for themselves. We intercede for anyone and everyone to see Jesus and accept his grace. Oh, Lord, draw those in bondage to sin. Lord, draw those who are broken by their burden. Lord Jesus, draw those who've, who've been burned by life. God honors the prayer that honors him. He honors the prayer that honors him, and he's not one to ignore the request. And as we build his kingdom, we're able to operate in the confidence that a church and a life, and a family, or a business, or whatever it is that we're building, that it's built on the foundation, that seeking his kingdom above all, it will not fail. All that's needed will be provided. And here's the greatest part right here. Because we intercede for his kingdom, his kingdom, it's our legacy. It's our inheritance and it's our legacy. And it's what we're going to get have look, to look forward to, and it's what we are known for. Oh, Jesus, let us be people that intercede according to your kingdom. This morning, I want to close with this thought right here. This series, it's about Noah, but ultimately it points to Jesus. Because Jesus is the one that's larger than life. Noah is like you and I. Any one of us could have been a Noah. But Jesus, none of us could be Jesus. And perhaps today you're in a storm and it doesn't feel like what it is that you've been building is going to last. Jesus does not build anything with failure in mind. And that includes you. That includes you. And so you can take comfort this morning in knowing that he has not stopped interceding for you. He still intercedes for you. He prayed for you 2,000 years ago in a room with 12 other people, 11 other people, because Judas had left. And he prayed for his disciples. He prayed for you and me. But now, look at Romans chapter 8, verse 34. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus who died. More than that, who was raised to life. He is at the right hand of God, and he is also interceding for us he is on your side keep going he is on your side keep building keep hammering keep building that ark that he's called you to build keep building that kingdom in his name build it in your family build it in your work build it in your community build it around your neighborhood Build it with your friends and family. And as you're building this morning, keep investing his provision. Keep your goals aligned with his. And keep intercession for the kingdom at the forefront of what you do. And it'll build, build to last. Would you bow your head and close your eyes with me today?